All right, well, we're going to get started so that you can go back and spend a lot of money on games, as I'm sure many of you are. Okay, if you don't know who I am, I'm Tom Vassell. I, re I review a few board games each year on a show called The Dice Tower. I've designed a, a, two board games in my life, but that's not enough to get on a designer panel. Um, so they're just having me moderate. So we have two very famous uh, board game designers with us. We'll start with the more famous of the two. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. So I'm going to let you introduce yeah, yourselves. My name's Tony Boydell, designer of Snowdonia, Guilds of London, and various little card games in the past. We've been here at the UK Game at Expo for every single year it's been on. So if you were at the Clarendon Suite back in 2007, I think it was, we were there sweating it out, along with Martin, because Martin was yeah. there as well at the start. So. Good old days. Yeah. Yeah. Happy days. Yeah, happy days, yeah. So, yeah, I'm Martin Wallace, uh, and I'm a board game designer. And I've come all the way from Australia to be here with you today. So, yeah. And I've done a few games. Right. So we'll talk about that in a bit. And so we're going to let you guys ask questions later on. So, you know, keep that in mind. Um, but one of the things I thought would be interesting is because I do a lot of these designer panels and they, they sound the same to me after a while. So what I did was we have two guys who have been here for more than a couple years. Um, if you go on the Internet, you'll find that there's a lot of people who design games. And they're gladly willing to tell you how to design a game and run a successful Kickstarter because they've done one. Um, but I'm more interested in people who've been around for a while and how designing has changed. Okay, because it's changed a lot. The designing in 2018 is very different than designing in when's the first year you did a game? Uh, the first time I published a game was 1993. Right, so that's a slight bit ago. I was still in college, no, high school. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when was the first game you designed? Uh, it was in 2000. Yeah, it was a little card game, Copper Twaddle. I reviewed that game, I remember. You did, yeah. Um, and uh, so, what would you think, uh, you know, we'll just discuss here, what, what are the major, well, let's talk about how you got into designing first. Like, what made you design a game back then? Um, I don't know, actually. I think, um, when I think back to it, it's an odd thing to do, but suddenly, I mean, I used to play games. I used to play games a lot when I was a kid. I used to play when I was a school, got into D&D, played quite a lot of heavy games, you know, squad leader, a lot of Avalon Hill SPI stuff. And then I kind of fell out of it for a while because family came along, kids came along. And then it was around about 1989, 1990 that I thought, for some reason, I thought, no, I want to try designing games. Um, I think it's because, uh, have you heard of somebody called Charles Vasey? Yes. Because um, he seemed to be making money selling games, printing them off and selling them via magazines. And I thought, oh, maybe there's some money there. Uh, and I think I found later it was a bit of a scam that he said he'd sold them all, but probably binned them or something. But, uh, but once I got the bug, uh, it's like, no, I, I, I couldn't let it go. And here I am today. Well, for me, it was... Um I was introduced to Magic the Gathering. I used to play a lot of board games and did role playing and that kind of stuff. But Magic the Gathering helped me turn um, a, a little family game that I was, I was doing um, based on a cartoon that I'd been drawing for quite a while. And it allowed me to sort of develop the game to be something a little bit more playable and a little bit more accessible. Because I had lots of chits and action points. It was very, very complicated. Covered a table, sort of the length of this entire sort of set of tables here. And Magic allowed me to focus down. Um, and then I would read the kids' books and read their storybooks and see, oh, look, there's a book about the world and the animals and where they live, and, oh, that would make a great game for the kids. And so I started mocking those things up. And suddenly you, the, you play a lot of games like Magic and you play board games like Settlers, and suddenly these things that were little notes in your notebook about wouldn't it be good if, I started actually extrapolating those wouldn't it be good ifs into what would a card look like, how many pieces would I have, how would somebody actually do what they needed to do in the game. Um, and most of the stuff I started with was quite simplistic, straightforward, very family, very jokey, very silly in a lot of cases. But then going to places like Essen in the early 2000s, you start seeing all the other games. And I stopped playing Magic the Gathering and started playing board games. And the more games that you play, the more they informed the kinds of things that I wanted to do. So my ideas that might have ended up as a 50 card card game for a family suddenly became a game with a board and proper pieces and a, and a turn sequence and became more complicated. So one of the things we're talking about here is how things have changed. Now you mentioned that you, Char uh, Charles Vasse, uh, was you thought there might be some money involved. Yeah, I mean. <sighs> but, but you didn't expect, did you expect to make a living from it? Yes, I did. I was very foolish. Um, very, I, 
I mean, to flesh the story out, so, yeah, I decided I want to start designing games. I, I designed a whole load of games that just didn't work. And then eventually I hit on something that did. The first game I designed that it worked. It was actually, you wanted to play it a second time, which is a game called Lords of Creation. Oh, and, ah, yeah. Yeah, you know, and so I printed it off, the first ones I printed it off uh, a desktop printer, because this is before the internet, this is 1992, this is a long time ago. Um, and I think, I think I printed off 50 of them, and I advertised them in Sumo. Do you know Mike Siggins? Right, yeah. uh, Sumo was a magazine that Mike Siggins did that, yeah. it was, again, predating the internet, just talking about board games. Yeah, so, and they sold out. And the weird thing was, I was getting phone calls from people in Germany. I said, like, what the hell is going on? Because I didn't know about the German market, really. Then. But I was, well, it was a bit confusing, because the guy from Germany had a heavy Scottish accent, because his white girlfriend was Scottish. It was a bit confusing. Are you really German? He said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm German, with a thick Scottish accent. So that, that made me aware of the German market. And, um, and I'd heard about Essen. And uh, oh, the, the, the guy who did, designed Railway Rivals, uh, David Watts, uh, I had a phone number for David Watts, and I said, uh, okay, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna reprint the game, I'm gonna do it properly in a box and whatnot, and um, let's see if we can get the game to Essen. So I phoned up David, and I said, uh, David, could, could you do me a favor? I know you go to Essen, could you um, take some games and sell them for me? And he said, no, go yourself, you lazy bugger. And that was the best advice he gave me, because um, we went. Um, First time in 1994, one of the original Frogettes is in the audience, Tim at the back there. There was me, Tim, and another mate of mine, Simon, in a white van, uh, full of these games that had just been delivered from the printers. Now, these weren't proper printers. This is a local printer in Stockport. And what we didn't know was that most of them, were, it wasn't until we got there, but we realized most of them were misprinted. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we drove overnight from Manchester to Essen, never been there before. We actually got to the stand on the Thursday of the morning. And interesting things have changed. Essen now is very sleek, slick production, but then you had to bring your own wallpaper and wallpaper paste to wallpaper the booze. Uh, we keep forgetting the wallpaper paste, so we'd always bug Richard Breeze, say, have you got any spare wallpaper paste, Richard? And uh, <laughs> So yeah, we set it up. We've, that, that's when we found out all these components were misprinted. So out of the 500, we had about 100 that we could sell. But we sold them, we sold them. And the game looked awful. I mean, it really was terrible artwork, terrible production. But there was a guy who came up called uh, Matthias Stober, and his, who bought the game and they said, and they'd done a reviewer. And there's so many people who came up and said, oh, if Matthias says it's a good game, then I'm gonna buy it. Now, you, you probably don't know, know the name Matthias Stobber. So he's now called Matthias Hardell. He's the guy who um, edits Spielbox, which is one of the biggest uh, uh, games magazines in the world. So he got his seal of approval. And so, yeah, and it's been going every year since. And now making money. Um, my debts are less than they used to be. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it, even 10 years ago, we were saying, hey, if you want to become a game designer who's full-time, you need to make a lot of money first mm. and live off that money. Yeah, you you know, start. There was very few full-time game designers 10 years ago. Now there's more. There's, there's, there's several um, that are out there. Did you think you were going to make money when you got into this? Uh, no, no, because when we uh, produced Copper Toddle, we didn't know that places like Cartamundi existed. So we ended up going to a proper printer to print a proper deck of cards and a proper box, and it cost way too much. Mm -hmm. So luckily, we did actually sell enough after the first Essen. But we went to our first Essen in 2002. Somebody said to us, oh, yes, great. It's 150,000 people over four days. And we thought, well, we've got 1,000 copies of this card. We'll sell that easy. OK. So we'll sell a thousand copies easily, no problem at all. So we got there, we sold 400, I think. You know, the expectation sort of far outweighed the reality of, of a show like that. But it's worse now, of course, because... It, it depends where you go. I mean, we'd, we'd see people go, I mean, there was a guy opposite, the first year we went, there was a guy opposite us, and he had this chess variant, and he had the most stunning pieces. I mean, they were machine-tooled aluminium. He spent a fortune, and he had a promotional video. And he sold 10 copies of his game in the entire show, and we sold a hundred boxes, which looked like you got them out of the refuse bin. So you just don't know. You, you really don't know what you're going to get when you go there. Um, but 
kind of following you know that by the making money. I remember the early days because that's when I met people like Rona Knizia and Alan Moon. Um, that was before Alan Moon became really famous, so he still talked to the hoi polloi. Um, and uh, their advice was pretty much the same. It's like, get out now, you know, stop it, go away, <laughs> just leave it. You'll never make a living. You just go back to teaching and just don't even think about being a full-time game designer. So I didn't take their advice. Well, I think, I think we got the impression when we were trying to pitch game design, certainly in the early 2000s, to companies that you'd get there and say, yes, this is, a, this is nice, yes, but I'm afraid we haven't got a slot for a game for the next three years because we're mm. printing games by Reiner Knizia and everybody else. Mm. So maybe Reiner was just sort of clearing the path for even ah, more. Yeah, he, he, he knew. He thought, oh, it's, it's about like the oldest gunslinger in town. So, oh, there's a new guy in town. He might be faster than me. I need to get rid of him. The opinions expressed in a dice tower. <laughs> um, but okay, so you mentioned meeting these other designers mm. and mentioned going to Essen. How important is that for a designer to go to these things and network? And because a lot of people are interested, hey, I want to get in designing. What do I do next? Is going to convention I, a useful thing? Yeah, I think something like Essen. I mean, it, somebody asked me if I would go to Essen ever, ever as, a, as a member of the public and just walk around and buy things and go home and not do anything exhibiting sort of way. But no, I like the, back, the backstage pass that you get because the people that you meet. And um, there are so many companies that, when we first started, that would appear one year at Essen. You know, they've pinned their mortgage on their game and it wouldn't sell and they'd go home. You'd never see them again. And we always made sure our money went back in the company to produce the next game. And then after a while, you kind of get a little badge just for longevity, really. You just, oh, you're still here. Oh, that's great. And people start talking to you. <laughs> yeah. It's quite funny with Richard Breeze. He was next to us on our first year at um, Spiel. And he was uh, releasing Cathedral. And you talk about the wallpaper paste. We paid to have wonderful wallpaper. We decorated our stand with curtains and beautiful tables. And we got medieval stuff to go with the copper toddle theme. He turned up with six monitor boxes full of his copies of Cathedral, slapped up this wallpaper paste and wrote in marker pen, Cathedral, 40 euros. Mm. And that was it. Its stand looked yeah. absolutely appalling. But the next morning, we're all stood there. Nobody's interested in us, but there's a huge queue coming from Richard's stand as everybody's come to pick up Cathedral. Yeah, it's, so. uh, he's definitely got... A, yeah, I think he's... He always used to look a little bit unhappy because, like... <sighs> got nothing to do, sold all my games. And this would be on the <laughs> Thursday. And it's, uh, it's, I don't even have a game to play with people. And it's like, but I want, because he, he wouldn't go through this experience of uh, demoing the game and then having the person go, hmm, this seems like a good game. I think I will pay money to take this game away. It'd be like, no, here's the money, enough to go. So it's new work involved. But uh, I mean, talking about meeting people, I mean, the first year, I was there, there was a journalist who came up to me and asked for a review copy of the game. And um, so I gave him a copy. And then the next year he comes back and says, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a journalist anymore. I'm working for a games company and um, just wondered if you, you know, interested in submitting some designs. And so this guy is now one of the top guys at Cosmos. Um, so it's pretty good contact to have. So that's, you know, this is the guy that allowed me to place games with you know, Cosmos, Gold Zebra, and so on. So, and you never know where, where that contact's going to come from. It's just somebody randomly coming up, and then you find out. Yeah, but what I'm hearing here is give games to reviewers, because you yeah. never know how influential they'll be later. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think that boat's gone. I think um, that was back then, nowadays. Oh, was, <laughs> okay, just, yeah. just checking. Okay, now, so things have changed since then. What are changes that you guys have seen in the industry while you're doing it, because making a game, like you said, Copper Twiddle, and back then, uh, all the different games that you made, today, I would imagine it would be very different in 2018. Yeah, I think it's, it'd be quite intimidating if you're starting from scratch, if you haven't got any help. So if you, to try and go it alone from the very beginning, it's, it's so much noise. How do you make your game stand out? I mean, there are perfectly fantastic games that came out last year, for instance, that nobody talks about anymore. There's nothing on BGG, there's no, reviews anymore, you know, they've come and gone and they were huge just for the six to eight weeks that they'd literally just been released in. So when you're a small company with a little chess variant or a little deck of cards, how on earth are you going to get anybody to stop at your stand rather than rush straight off to the Asthma Day stand or the contents of Hall 3 that aren't Asthma Day, which is a very small bit right at the end by the toilets. Um, 
Yeah, it's just so difficult now. But I think, I don't know whether the folks here agree. I, if you go to Essen, actually, quite a lot of people recommend is ignore all the big companies because you can get those games at any time. You know, they'll come through distribution. It's no problem at all. Go and have a look at the little games. So maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's actually it's better as a small publisher starting now. Um, see, I'd probably say it's a, lot, it's a lot harder now than it was when I started because when I went to Essen, nobody was doing the type of games that I was doing. The, the, the big companies, they just want to do family games. So they, they don't want to do more complex um, games. And the only other companies that were kind of doing complex games are people like, you got your American companies like Avalon Hill, but they, did, they, they wouldn't go to us and they wouldn't know what it was. Uh, you did have Mayfair going, so that's one. And then the other major one then is Ragnar Brothers. Um, you know, they, they were going to Essen. Well, they, no, actually, they weren't going to Essen because they were teachers. That was their problem. They were publishing games. And they were publishing games like um, History of the World, which has just been reprinted by um, Zeman. So, you know, they, they were actually highly, influ they were certainly highly influential to me as people who early on proved that you could get games published. Um, not necessarily make money, but at least get them published. Um, but back then, because there was no competition, you know, I, I could turn up, the first couple of years, there was, there was one game I turned up, and I, I'd, I'd photocopied the game. And there's a review that Pevens did, which said, uh, you have to play the game quickly because the toner falls off. So, <laughs> but we sold it. You know, you, you could really sell, you know, if people thought the game was good, it didn't matter about the artwork. And um, now, you, there's no way you could get away with that now. I mean, I would dread being a first-time game designer now. Because I think also the thing is, if you're going to go into game designer, being a game designer, you have to be a lot better right from the start. I mean, uh, in the old days, you know, you could release some games and it'd be okay. But it's, that's kind of your training, you know, your apprenticeship. You, you'd, you'd be given a free pass for a few games. Like, yeah, they're okay, but maybe you've got better stuff in you. But I think now you have to hit the ground running with something amazing. Like, for instance, like Gloomhaven. I mean, that, Isaac, I think it's only his second game. Right. But that's hitting the ground running with something amazing. You can't just do some little itty bitty game and expect to get into the market. Yeah, the one thing you mentioned there was making games look good. Mm. So like we can even use an example, Brass. Mm. The, the first edition of Brass and the version that just came out from Roxley, vastly different, but the version that came, is coming out from Roxley, that's kind of what we expect games to look yep. like at this point. Yes, absolutely. I guess, I guess so, whether there's any crossover, because I mean, a designer is supposed to design the game. So when you're prototyping things, you don't have super you know, eight inch minis that are finely sculpted. You have whatever you have around the place. You have standees and you have cubes and you have meeples. So how much of us in our responsibility as designers is to think about how the components in their upgraded form could affect the gameplay? Or do we just have to say, no, here's the game design. I don't care whether you use, you know, empty bottles or full blown miniatures, the game is the game. And then you leave it to the publisher to decide we're gonna now produce all these super duper Miniatures. Does, does Eric Lang decide, right, Rising Sun is going to be this game because I'm going to have all these wonderful things around it? Yes. Or does he design it with Yes, the cubes that's what he's paid to do. Well, I, yeah. That is he, what he's he paid to do. He does design it with do. the cubes, but I yeah, see it. Mine is a sort of rhetorical He's question, working for you know, a company yeah, so. that produces plastic pieces. If it didn't have plastic pieces, then he gets sacked. But how many of these games, I mean, the retail copies of Rising Sun don't have the miniatures, but the game still plays the same game. Oh, no, they they have have they just yeah. They're not the same. Not the same. So it's... How much do we have to think about pimping up our games as part of the design, or how much do we leave it to the... Well, this is a good segue, because both of you mm. decided to do the designer publisher thing yourselves. Mm. Is that a wise idea? Um, now you've got Kickstarter, yeah. I mean, Kickstarter is awesome. If, you know, if you're an unknown game designer... Because you were just passing on the buck, and now yeah. you're doing it anyway. Yeah, I guess you just, it's, it's how much you're willing to take the gamble, really. I mean, I was quite lucky. My job meant I had a bit of cash floating around, so it, I could spend it on that, or I could spend it on a posh car or something, and I decided to spend it on games. Bad idea. First game costs us a fortune. But I guess don't bet your house on these things, oh, really. No. There, there's, um, this is just, it's like going off-piste a bit, but yeah, I remember years ago when I first started publishing games, there was this guy who was trying to encourage young game designers, you know, and 
he'd always pass them on to me to give him advice as somebody who'd actually published a game. So that meant I knew everything because I published a game. And this, this guy contacted me. He had a game called Gives Us a Job. This is back in the days of the boys from the black stuff. And he, he basically, it was, a, it was a game about being unemployed because there's a lot of unemployed people who are willing to spend 40 pounds on a game about being unemployed. And he, he basically, <laughs> he, he, he said he, he decided to go ahead with it because he went to see a fortune teller and she said there'd be great changes in his life. So he bet the house on the game. He lost the house, he lost his wife, he lost his job, he lost everything. So yes, there were great changes. And I actually picked up a copy in a, in a um, auction and it was awful. It was just terrible. He basically got ripped off. This company says, oh yeah, we'll publish this for you. And he, like vanity publishing. And yeah, you, you can lose everything. Um, this is an encouragement part of our, of our <laughs> yeah. show today. Well, it also works at a different scale in that, um, have any of you heard of Eagle Games? Vaguely familiar. You might be familiar with Eagle Griffin Games, but there's an original company called Eagle, Eagle Games. And this is a guy who used to work for Microprose and had a load of money. And he came into the games industry, board games industry and he lost it all. You know, just pissed it all away. Oh, excuse my French. So he went back to the computer games industry and made a load of money from computer games and he came back to the board games industry and lost it all. And you kind of think, there's a lesson here. You know, <laughs> maybe there's something, and he's not the only one. There's a number of uh, internet entrepreneurs who've come into the board games industry and lost it all. The only ones I can think of who have actually succeeded are Days of Wonder. They got it right. Well, just as a heads up, he's now started another company. Yeah. He okay. hasn't lost it all yet. It's still oh, okay. <laughs> their first game's coming out this year. Yeah. <laughs> um, so another thing that's happened since you guys have started designing games, and you mentioned earlier, was there was a lack of internet when you first. Mm. Like, m m people in America and Britain didn't really even know Essen existed, right? It was like word of mouth, like, hey, there's this amazing convention in Germany. Mm. Once the internet came, everyone knew about it. How has the internet changed what you do as designers? I mean, I know you do a blog. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's, it's enormous. It's the reach, the markets that you couldn't normally get to. You know, you can do your own marketing now without actually spending a huge amount of money. You know, get yourself a Facebook page set up, do some BGG stuff. You know, you don't need to spend a fortune to get your names out there. Um, it's absolutely essential. You can't, can't see how you could function without it now. It's also introduced me to some of my best friends. The internet's just been an amazing place. So. Oh, yeah. It's, I mean, the internet's fundamentally changed the nature of our world. It's not just games, it's everything. I mean, God, even with these Tesla cars, they send updates by the internet. You know, it just, imagine the world without the internet. That'd be weird, wouldn't it? it just, well, that's what we're talking about now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, Way back in the days, the yeah. dark ages. But I suppose there's lots of positives. I suppose if you're going to look at the negatives, um, yes, the positives, yes, you can communicate with your audience, you can. You could, I mean, I, without the internet, I couldn't run a business from Brisbane. I couldn't, you know, it's just not possible. But the internet allows you to do that. But it also brings you into all of those people that you might not want to deal with. Um, I'm, I'm planning on having a T-shirt made, and it's going to say on it, anybody can be a dick on the internet, but it's not obligatory. Um, you get these people, just say the most stupid things, and you, they just bug you about things, and then um, you, you have to kind of develop, and you get a lot more people reviewing your games without maybe understanding it, which means you, you have to develop a bit of a thicker skin to be able to deal with some of the criticism. And then, then you get these games, if you do say the wrong thing or something on the internet, then you, you, then you get the pitchfork brigade coming after you, burning your house down. I mean, there's things I'd like to say on the internet. I think, if I say that, somebody's going to come out and whack me. They're going to kill me because I, I dissed their game. And it becomes all religious. And... That hasn't happened to me yet, though. So <laughs> You're a big, scary American. <laughs> <laughs> I'm protected. Um, yeah, well, I, I think you know, there, there's changes. Like you mentioned, it's much harder to get into now. But there's also some benefits with the Internet of a new designer has a wealth of information at them. You now know, or you should know, to not show up at Essen with 2,000 games mm. because that's probably not the right number, you know. So um, you've, we talked about you, you know, both of you publishing, but you've pulled back from publishing and now you're just a design yeah. studio. And you like that better? Um, it's kind of forced on me because 
the market's changed. It used to be in the old days, yeah, you could sell anything. You know, you just publish the game, didn't have to do any marketing, it sold itself. And then Kickstarter fundamentally changed the nature of the market. And so the games that were printing were just not selling in the same quantities. So, you know, your artwork costs are going up because you've got to keep up with the standards that everybody else is putting out. I tried Kickstarter, I don't do social media. It's not in me, it's just not me. And I thought, I don't want, I don't want to keep doing Kickstarter. I'm not very good at it. So it's basically focus on what you're good at. And the nice thing is because there are so many games companies out there now, they're all after content. So it is possible to make a living as a full-time game designer because the kind of games back in the 90s that nobody wanted, now everybody wants them. Everybody wants these crunchy, heavy strategy games. Uh, I mean, God, if Brass can make 1.7 million Canadian on Kickstarter. It's like, yeah, the world has changed. Well, then. <laughs> Well, sorry, what was the question again? I was, I was, just, I was just lost in listening to Martin's. <laughs> oh, no, I actually, I was specific. Name, but let yeah, me ask you, yeah, okay. because both of you um, have some similarities in the fact that you both put a lot of history into your games. You both okay. look into history, you know. Uh, what is it about that that you find fascinating? I mean, because your games, I can always read, like, in the back, and, like, mm. uh, you, you've done games on things I didn't even know existed. Mm. You know, I now know that, you know, more about miners and water and and yeah. you've done stuff on the history how important it is is that to you to get the history into the games correct you're gonna start yeah well i just i i'll only design games about themes that engage me um and i'm a bit of a hopeless romantic so a lot of english history is is fantastic and rich and it's a good source for um game designs i love the theme first i'm not an abstract gamer so i it helps me engage more with the with, with the game um, if, if the theme is accessible or it pleases me in some way. And then once I, once I latch onto it, then I want it to be absolutely right. I want, every de I want details in there. I want things that people may not notice until you know, five or six plays in and go, oh, hang on a sec, he's done this. Oh, that's, that links back to that bit of history or that's, that, that's true in that certain situation. You know? So for me, it's just like it's a complete, completeness thing. It's a, it's a holistic thing. I want the game to work, but I also want the theme to be right, and I want it to be true and honest and engaging. Um, yeah, I mean, I did history. Um, that, uh, I, did, I, I wouldn't say university, because it was then Manchester Polytechnic, because I did it as a mature student. So, although it is now a university, but it's still really a polytechnic. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, you kind of figure, what do you do with a history degree? Like, well, initially, well, the only thing you can do with it is teach. Um, but actually, there is something else you can do with a history degree, which is you can design board games because you oh. can pick on a historical subject. And the, thing, the, the only thing a history degree teaches you is to read very dull books without falling asleep. <laughs> and, you know, and, and the, the, so it's a transferable set of skills. So it's, like, it's not just history. So if I, it's like with the um, Discworld game I did, that was a case of I'd never really read Terry Pratchett before, but it's like, no, I'm going to do a Discworld game. So I read all of the books and then tried to distill down those elements, which is very much what you do when you're writing a history essay. You know, you'll read a lot about a subject and then you, you try and distill it down to its essence. You're trying to find those key elements within that period. And it's exactly the same process of designing a board game. You know, you, you do the research, you identify the key elements, and then you model those in some way or another. All right, what we want to do now is we want to open it up for some questions. But before we do, there's two questions you can't ask. Mm -hmm. You can't ask, what do you start your design with, theme or mechanism? Because <laughs> a million designers have answered that on the internet. Yeah. And secondly, you can't say, I have a game I'm designing, and I like, no, you can advertise your game later. Mm. Um, so, if you have any questions, raise your hand. We have a mic for you. Just make sure you talk closely into it so we can get it. Anyone? Otherwise, you guys have been fantastic. Oh, okay. I used to be a teacher too, and I, I taught geography. I wonder if you'd ever thought of designing games for use uh, in a classroom where, you know, you can have 30 odd kids in groups playing a game. Because the ones I encountered through textbooks were. Dire. Um, dire is a very nice yeah. word. The, the, the thing is, I, again, yeah, I used to be a teacher and there would be educational games and they're all awful. They are terrible. Because the thing is, people miss the point about games in that games in themselves, doesn't matter what they are, they're educational. Because I mean, I, what I used to do at Christmas, I'd bring a whole load of these Euro games 
into the classroom. Now, the fact that it wasn't teaching them history or geography was irrelevant. The fact was, in, I taught in some pretty rough schools, it was teaching them to be social without stabbing each other. It was teaching them to follow a set of rules. And also, the thing with the educational games they used to play, they, they were so boring. They got the idea that games were somehow painful. And the whole point of a game is, yes. it's fun. So I mean, I'd play things like bluff with them. I, I had a kid, couldn't read or write, but he could play bluff. Okay, and he really enjoyed that, because it's just about calling the odds. They used to love Carabande, you know, flicking. They, they, they even played Phantoms of the Ice. They love Phantoms of the Ice. I mean, you, you won't have heard of this. It's an old Alan Moon game. And so it, it didn't have to have content. It's just the very fact that it's an enjoyable game in itself had value. Now, you probably couldn't get away with that nowadays in a school, because things have to have value. But again, going back to geography, I mean, I learned all of my geography playing war games because they're on maps, you know. And you, you, you learn not directly, but sort of indirectly, just by being exposed to the shape of Europe, generally where Berlin is, where Ireland is, and these things. You're not consciously learning, but actually subconsciously you are learning. Yeah, I was just at a school convention and talking about this to every person who walked by, and I said, I'm here to talk about educational board games, and their face was always like, mm. <laughs> and I say, yeah, I know, I agree. Educational board games are pretty bad, and it frustrates me that kids are turned off from it. They'll hear educational board game, they automatically assume it's bad because they mostly are. So as people who know about these games, it's our responsibility to find the ones that are good, and there are games that are really fun and educational, and in all the different subjects, and I've done several lists on this that you can find on our channel. Um, but, I, but what I think is important, like you said, is that it has to be fun. I, I, I cannot fathom how that, that's so important, because if the game isn't fun, why are you even playing a game? Just do, uh, do some quizzes and, and read some books. The game has to be fun first, education is second, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree 100%. I mean, you, you can play Ticket to Ride, and at the end of Ticket to Ride, you're knowing the rough geography of America. If you play Europe, you know the rough geography of Europe. You know where everything is in relation to everything else. You don't need to ram it down their throat and say, kids, you need to learn all of this. You just need to play Ticket to Ride three or four times, and they will know where Paris is in relation to Vienna, in relation to Ankara, or whatever you're, you're looking at. For those of you watching us on the internet, we know some of the cities in Ticket to Ride are not exactly where they're <laughs> supposed to be. Yeah. That doesn't matter, though, because Americans don't have a sense of geography anyway. <laughs> we'll edit that part out. <laughs> Any other questions? Up front. Hi, yeah. Just talking history, I just wondered what you thought about uh, games around darker themes, such as this War of Mine, Freedom, the Underground Railroad, Road, that sort of thing. Uh, I welcome those things. They're certainly something like this War of Mine. Um, there's the game, um, Michael Fox is one of the designers of the guy that's dying and you're trying to get sort of, get his memories out of him. I think games that can have a little bit more depth, a little bit more adult theme, but not in that way. I think they're really important because it's crossing over. We've seen narrative appearing a lot more as an important element of games, so time stories and uh, pandemic legacy and so on. It's, I think it's really important that people can see it's more than just pushing a couple of cubes around a map. It's, there can be more. And if you can make people cry or make people genuinely frustrated and angry because of a situation that's so emotive to them, I think that's a really powerful thing. And it shows you that games are more than just, you know, totting up a total at the end and seeing who's got one more than the other person. So I, I welcome that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, so I'm not sure if I'm so convinced because, again, it comes back to games should be fun in that you, you know you, you can have games that model reality very well but the problem with reality is deeply frustrating and I think the reason why a lot of players like games is because they're not real because you have control and people just love this idea of controlling their own destiny rather than the reality is where we just tossed at random from event to event. Um, but I mean, certainly in, in, in also in thinking in terms of theme, I know there's sometimes there's some themes, uh, you know, that I might like to do, but I would shy away from because it's possibly they're dark and also because they're contentious. I mean, an example of that would be 
uh, well, there's two games I did that do, do a study in Emerald in Australia. Um, and the study of Emerald, uh, for those who don't know it, is a kind of mixture of fantasy and anarchism. Um, and the reason is that is because I wanted to do a hist game about the history of anarchism, but the history of anarchism is blowing up rich people. And I thought, the Americans are not going to like this. It's sending the wrong message. So I made the rich people monsters. The monsters don't have rights. It's, it's okay to kill monsters. It's just it's fine. And a similar thing with Australia. In the, it's a game about the colonization of Australia, but you, you cannot do that without dealing with the indigenous tribes people. And you will never come or walk away from that argument well, it's just not going to go well. So I figured, yeah, we'll use monsters again. That's fine. We'll just replace these people with monsters, and then we can kill them. Yeah, I'm glad, though, that you said that. I like that when you said darker themes. That's actual dark themes, not, oh, look, I can make a monster with 74 mm. arms. Mm. Um, and you mentioned adult. And it's yeah, there's actually adult games out there that are really adult games that deal with adult themes rather than, hey, ha, ha, I made you say this word. Mm. In public. <laughs> Any other questions? There's some, oh. Thanks. Um, with the way of modern gaming is now, um, is it possible if you're a new designer to almost reinvent the wheel in terms of mechanisms, or should you be looking to just build on what's already out there if you're looking to get a game noticed and, and, and um, get it to market? You know, before you answer that, are there any mechanisms that you feel like you've started? That I've started? So I think somebody mentioned that I might have invented worker placement, but I'm not sure. I said that once. Yeah. I might have um, been lying. It's difficult to tell. I think the thing is, you're not. The thing is, the major genres of games are based on human psychology. Okay? And the thing is, that's a known quantity, and you're not. I think they've all been covered. I mean, but by that, the, the examples are you have standard board games, and that, that, that feeds into our desire to play games. And the, the, the games we have today are functionally identical to the games that the Egyptians played. They, they have not changed in any way, shape, or form. The standard format for 5,000 years, which is you have a board, you have some playing piece, you have some dice. So board games have not changed. The things that have added to that, you have games of gambling, okay? So you have poker. So you have your gambling section because humans like to gamble. The recent ones that have really taken on have fed into other psychological needs. So the best example of that would be role playing. I mean, role playing, D&D went massive, not because it was a great system. It's not, it's not, it's not a great set of rules. It's not amazing. But it fed into this human desire to be somebody else, okay? To role play, to pretend that you're somebody that you're not. Um, I think the other one, uh, Trivial Pursuit, that did mega because that feeds into our desire to be a show off, uh, know all. Um, and then finally, Magic the Gathering, collecting. People, I mean, I don't collect, but people collect all sorts of weird, random stuff. And here is a game all about collecting stuff. Now, I don't think, I think all of the psychological bases have now been covered. So I don't think there's anything new out there, but I, I could be mistaken. Um, I defer to that very eloquent answer. I agree, I agree with all mm. of that. Yeah. That sounds like a really good, interesting... Yeah. Longer discussion of different there, psychological there could be aspects. A, there could be a paper on that. Somebody could because people get do all sorts of stupid things at university now. <laughs> <laughs> we had a question over here. So we were talking, or you guys were talking earlier about how the internet had changed things. From a designer point of view, do you ever consider a um, how a board game or a card game could be translated into more digital um, formats, either like an application or translated onto something that could be hosted on like tabletop simulator, allowing like groups of people um, that are friends over the internet to be able to actually access those games without being able to physically get around a table together? Yes. Well, my answer, <laughs> my answer is no, because I don't have to do this for a living. Um, um, I work with computers all day, so the last thing I want to do is spend my hobby pushing things into the computer world. I, I retreat from that, that pain, in the, pain in the bottom world of mm. IT. 
No, I think, seriously, I mean, the, the thing you touch on is actually something I'm actively investigating at the moment. And uh, I've recently moved to Australia, and there's quite an active video game design group, which I've managed to insinuate myself into. So you've got a whole bunch of hungry app designers there who, you know, don't have day jobs, and they're, they're looking for their big break. And, I'm, and then when, they, when they see my Wikipedia, and says, oh, my God, you've had stuff published. It's like, it's awesome. Um, but the, the thing is, I do think you, you get computer games, you get board games, and then you get... The board get you get the computer game port of the board game, so you get Puerto Rico on the computer game, or you'll get through the ages, and it's always a faithful one-to-one -one port. And it seems to me you're missing the point. You know, computers can do things that you can't do on a board game. So what I'm thinking about is games that. They're simpler than these massive games like Red Dead Redemption or whatever. These mega games, these AAA games, I mean, they hold no interest for me because I get bored after five minutes. I wouldn't have no idea the word. But what I'm thinking about are games that you can play in 10 minutes or so that have a degree of strategy to them. It's not all about dexterity, but they have a degree of strategy to them. There's some sort of story art. They feel like a board game but they don't get tied down with the board game conventions you have to have because you're working in the physical world. So, and I'm not sure, so I, because I don't play many computer games, I'm not sure to what degree other companies have explored this, but it seems to me there is a potential market there to take the best of computer gaming, which is basically bookkeeping. It does all the bookkeeping for you, and then mix it with the elegance of board game design. Because the thing with computer game designers, they don't have to be elegant. They can have as many, they can have whatever they want in a computer game because memory is pretty much unlimited. Whereas a board game, everything has to be tight. And it's trying to marry the two. All right, any others? Oh, in the back corner? Well, wait, wait for the mic, that way we can re record it later. That's good. Thank you. So, um, it's, all the time, a lot of different innovative mechanics are, are, are coming out for games, and a lot of the time, well, people end up trying to iterate on them. Like, say, when you know when Dominion came out, and you know the deck building concept was very. Everyone's come up with a with a deck building game. Have you been ever tempted to look at another game, like follow up on a trend? And has that worked? Did that ever work for you, or did it bite you bite you in the bum? And did you ever figure out why? Well, I love worker placement, and my, my big break, if you like, came with Snowdonia, and that's worker placement. So I saw what other people were doing, particularly with the games like Agricola, and saying, oh, that's a great okay, game. Apparently, he did worker placement. Oh, well, I think you'll have a fight with Richard Breeze over that. And, uh, I, I, I think I, we'd I all pay probably to would that. defer to Richard, actually. <laughs> yeah, he did it properly. Yeah, so I, 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 I play a lot of games as well as design games, and if I like something in a game, and I like a mechanic or a way it's done, then you, you should be able to reuse it. Um, as long as it's not a straight rip-off, that's fine. Um, it's a good idea, then, then make use of it. If it helps with the theme as well, then that's, that's even better. Yeah, I mean, I, I obviously, I mean, I took the deck building mechanic and I used it in a few acres of snow, and that did come back to bite me on the bum because the game was broken. Um, so, because I didn't fully understand how deck builders work, because I, I mean, I did play a little bit of Dominion, so I, I took the concept, but without understanding the extreme strategies that can lead to issues. Um, but then you do end up in a problem, I found myself in a problem with that I'm working on a new theme, a new, trying to come up with a new game theme, and I'd be using deck building. And it's like, I really need to stop doing this, I need to stop using this mechanism because it ends up you go down the same line but unfortunately I mean, there's a game there's a company here that asked me to work on a game a particular theme and I did my best to make it not a deck builder and then it ended up a deck builder and it works as a deck builder <laughs> and it's deeply frustrating it's a really good deck building game it's like but it's a deck builder but anyway I, I mean I think it's a good idea too I, one thing I think a board game designer should do is play a lot of games, right? And it's good to get ideas from other games and, and use those. And as long as you're not, again, making the one-for-one -one copy, when we designed Nothing Personal, we obviously looked at Kremlin, right? And we thought it was, hey, let's remake that. But by the time we were done, it was nothing the same. It was a completely different game. But we definitely started with some ideas we got from that. Have you ever heard the story about Reiner, Knizia, and Quirkle? 
No. Yes, I have heard that yes. story, but go ahead and tell it. Okay, so basically Reiner, he's not in the audience, is he? No, no. he's not. <laughs> <laughs> Reiner does not play other people's games because he does not want his ideas or thoughts to be polluted by the thoughts of others. Any Germans in the audience? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> why do we need that caveat? But oh, anyway, I, just before I say anything, that might be too rude. Um, but anyway, so he designs basically in a box, a self-contained box of Reiner ideas. No other ideas get in. And he had this great idea for a game uh, that was kind of a version of a version of a version of another game of one, because it tends to be it reiterating the same idea or different thing. And so he sits there in front of his playtesters and he says, okay, I've got this new idea game playtester. And they turn and says, you know, that's Quirkle. He just reinvented the wheel because he'd not looked outside and seen what else is out there. Now that's part of being, I think, a good game designer. It's both, you play other games just to know what other people are up to so you don't accidentally invent the same game. But also, you do get inspired by other people's games, you know, because you know, some of those games out there, well, there's one that inspires you because they're awesome, and then there's the other ones that are like, how did they get away with that? But I think as um, players, you, are also, you, you will often sort of lapse into being a game designer because you'll criticize elements of a game. You'll say, that was a great game, but I didn't like the, de the event deck, or I didn't mm. like the way that you converted this to that. So we're just the same when we play games, you go, well, I like that, but I didn't like that bit. And if I was doing it, I'd have done it slightly differently. And you guys all do it as well. So, you know, there's a, I think it's a natural inclination to sort of criticize. Um, and then some of us decide to take that criticism and turn it into something that we think is better. It may not be, but that's for someone else to judge. You know, speaking of that, you mentioned games can be an inspiration. For both of you, what game has been the biggest uh, that's designed by somebody else has been the biggest influence on you as a designer? Uh, good question. Um, there been, I mean, there's a couple of games that have influenced me. I think Francis Tresham has had a big influence on me because of the elegance of his designs. They're just really finely engineered. I mean, he, he just these things where there's no luck. It's just all about inputs and processes. And um, it's a thing of beauty. And it's just something you could aspire to, but... I think you just have to have that particular engineer's mind to be able to do that. Um, so, yes, yeah, so things, games like Civilization and the Dutch Revolution, those, those are inspirational. Um, I'm trying to think of other ones. Um, but th those would be the main ones. Uh, we were, as a, as a sort of very early gaming group, influenced very much by Samurai Swords, or I think mm. it's called Ikuza. So we, we did, played Risk, but Samurai Swords is Risk with more Euro elements to it. So you allocate your your coins to, to get different aspects of, of the strategy. And that opened up this idea that it wasn't just rolling the dice and it was, you know, that's the way it was. You could actually do a little bit more planning. Mm -hmm. And then the next one really is Magic the Gathering because of the way it opened up my head to sort of how you could do more with, with these limited components. And it allowed me to translate my first ever design into something that, that we felt was much more playable and much more enjoyable. And then that started me doing other stuff. So while magic may not influence my designs to a great extent, it's certainly the thing that, that stepped me onto this designing bus. All right, any other questions? Yes, sir. Hello, um, I was wondering if, as game designers and as a reviewer, Tom, um, if having such uh, so many interactions with board games, does it take away from the magic of playing a game? Do you analyze it a lot more than you feel you would if you weren't in the profession that you currently are in? Yes. I, I'm terrible. <laughs> no, I'm terrible. Whenever I play games, all I do is analyze them. And the people who play with me complain and say, stop analyzing the game. Just have fun. But I can't help it. Well, I'm opposite. Again, I say no. I... I just love playing board games. So mm. if I had to stop designing tomorrow, it wouldn't matter because I love playing board games mm. so much. I'm mostly terrible at most games. A couple of games I'm quite good at. I'm quite good at Kalimala, Fabio. I enjoy that very much. Mm. Yeah, I, I was already analyzing games before I started reviewing, so nothing's really changing. I do the same thing with my food. I'm like, this is pretty good or this is not <laughs> so good. So yes, that does go through your head. 
And some things change. Like, for example, when I watch a movie, I'm now watching how they do the lettering and the things because I do video work now. I'm like, huh. But with a board game, I just, I was already critiquing them. So I thought, well, why not just do this? You know, maybe someone else will care what I think, which is kind of egotistical, but <laughs> it worked. But I suppose there's also, I mean, there's the game itself and then there's who's you playing it with. So I do, I do accept that, yeah, the, the certain games work well with certain groups. You know, that, okay, it might not be the best game in the world, but with the right group, it can be amazing. Uh, I think there's some guys I played with in New Zealand because they loved Spartacus. And I think they got really annoyed with me because they, they got into the role-playing side of it. And I just worked out, oh, there's a strategy I can do here and win in two turns. And that really annoyed the hell out of them because they were just having fun hitting people. They, they weren't <laughs> trying to play, win. They were just, oh, I just want to stab you. Or I want to throw things out. I want to do this. And I'm just thinking, I just want to get to six feet. Or whatever, they only played. I just need to get to six feet points. And if I do this, that, and the other, I do that. And, oh, okay, you won, fine. Martin Wallace, fun murderer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, I think we have time for one last question. Um, I've heard recently from some friends of mine who have bought games on Amazon that what the copies I've bought have been fake. Have you guys had any problems with that and like fraudulent or copyright infringement, things like that? Uh, I, I won't have because we don't produce a huge quantity of our games, so I, I've not experienced that. Uh, same here. I mean, those, those games that are being counterfeited are the games that they know they can sell. So they're going to be counterfeiting things like Catan and Pandemic. There is nobody out there that's going to be counterfeiting one of like Lords of Creation. It's just not happening, you know. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting because um, you, China is this kind of wild west area where yeah there's a lot of stuff going on that you, you you can't monitor so stuff can be printed over there and you've just got no idea that it's going on there's no way of monitoring it in the same way that you could monitor if ludofact is printing something <clears throat> but there are at some point if china wants to engage more with the western world it is going to have to start policing that because Doing counterfeit games only takes you so far, you know, if they, if they want to, because their games market is developing, you know, eventually, I mean, they're about 20 years behind us in terms of their taste for games. And if they want to develop uh, a board games market, if they want to be taken serious by the West, then they're, they're going to have to clean up their game, it seems to me, or I could be completely wrong and it will carry on doing it. But no, it's only the big games that get affected. Hey guys, I really appreciate that. Those are really great, thoughtful questions, and we really appreciate you asking them. And I'd like to thank Martin and Tony both for coming on board and answering these and taking thank some time too. out to come and do this today. And uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, we, uh, we'll be doing a Dice Tower Top 10 tomorrow. We hope you come by and see that. We're doing Top 10 Games We Love, but we uh, suck at um, <laughs> So, uh, and, and you'll be at your booth, yeah. which is? 1T8, uh, the Surprise Stair booth. And you'll be all over the place. Um, yeah, man, I'm doing, if it's a promotional spot, I'm helping promote Wildlands Osprey. You should check it out. It's an excellent game. And also Lincoln, I'm promoting on the PSC stand, both in Hall 1. I don't remember where. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. We really appreciate it.